This is the story of a fight to the death. It would not result just in the death of a man, but of a whole city and the culture that went with it. This is the story of a hundred years of struggle, a struggle in which there could only be one winner. The victor would emerge from the arena with a triumph which was complete and absolutely final. The loser would disappear for all time. In the war between the two greatest city-states of the ancient world, there was to be no compromise, no mercy. It was to be a struggle for the domination of the Western Mediterranean that could only end with the complete extinction of one through the victory of the other. In this fight to the death, many great men were to fall victim to the carnage of war. Among them, the brilliant mathematician Archimedes, the Carthaginian general Hanno, and most famous of all, Hannibal the Great. In the grim annals of history, many cities have been taken by siege and storm, the population slaughtered, their houses sacked, and their gods despoiled. But they rise again. We rebuild, repopulate. Not so Carthage. Look at any modern atlas. You'll search in vain for that name. Carthage, of course, was a maritime um, city because they're essentially Phoenicians, and it lies on the North African coast. It's the furthest point sticking out into the Mediterranean, closest, in fact, to the, the great islands of Sicily and Malta. And it stands on the western side of a great bay, so it's a marvellous place for traders, for safety. Roman had taken several years to get complete control over Italy. But once that had been established, of course, it was going to start looking elsewhere. And the great problem ahead of them now was, of course, to be Carthage, the greatest naval power of the world at that time. And the question was which or the other was going to win in the end. A once proud city, destroyed so completely it was never rebuilt. That chilling fact speaks volumes for the savagery of this conflict and the bitterness of the foe. Carthage has been a problem for scholars in Western Europe in the last 100 or 150 years. Carthage was seen in the late 19th century as a mercantile city in contrast to the mainly agrarian states of the rest of the Mediterranean, and it was therefore drawn into controversies of 19th century political history between, say, the landed aristocracy and the new capitalist merchants. People saw Carthage as basically a capitalistic trading city, its economy not based on the exploitation of agriculture, but rather on control of the sources of gold and tin from the Western Mediterranean. For almost a hundred years, the conflict flared, engulfing land and people as the armies surged back and forth on the insatiable quest for power and land. But when the end eventually came, it would be terrible in its finality. Rome's obsession with the struggle was reflected in the popular phrase uttered by Cato, Delenda est Carthago, Carthage must be destroyed. For their part, the Carthaginians were equally dedicated to the fight. Their greatest general, Hannibal, summed up the importance of the conflict. We have accomplished nothing till we have stormed the gates of Rome, till our Carthaginian standard is set in the city's heart. <laughs> 
The campaigns against Carthage were the first which the Romans had fought outside of Italy. In 264 BC, Rome had not yet begun to scale the heights of world domination, but they would. And it is the victor who writes history. The war between Rome and Carthage has therefore come to be known by the name the Romans called it. They named the Carthaginians Poeni, or Phoenicians. The long series of wars that these people fought and ultimately lost are therefore known as the Punic War. It was a conflict in three distinct stages, which began in 264 BC and finished 82 years later with the grand finale, annihilation of Carthage. An event which was to be a turning point in Western history, the birth of the Roman Empire. This was the last of the great struggles between the city-states which characterized warfare in the ancient world. Through the defeat of Carthage, Rome established herself as the undisputed and unrivaled leader of the civilized world. As always, economic factors lay behind the causes of the war. Carthage was the dominant trading nation in Africa. Rome had just begun her rise to prominence in Europe. As long as Carthage remained the principal player in Africa, there was an uneasy but peaceful relationship between the two cities. Once Carthage began to cast her eyes enviously towards Europe, the course towards war had been set. As a base from which to expand her trading empire, Carthage had established an impregnable military base on the island of Sicily. The town of Messana had been controlled for 25 years by a group of Italian mercenaries called the Mamertines. They were being besieged by King Hero of Syracuse, the wealthiest and most spectacular of Greek cities on Sicilian soil. In order to defend themselves, the Mamertines call on the support of a passing Punic commander. Well, no Carthaginian would hesitate to take advantage of such an offer. So he moves in and establishes a foothold in Messana. King Hero does back off, but now the Mamertines have an even bigger problem because they can't get rid of the Punic garrison. Therefore, they call on Rome as their allies to come and give them protection. The Romans are not keen to get involved. They are worried about offending the Carthaginians, but nonetheless they do send a relief expedition. And thus, what amounted to a little local difficulty escalated into what we know as the Punic War. The Carthaginians realized that the Roman presence in Sicily would upset the delicate balance of power. They immediately began a large-scale build-up of troops, mercenaries from Liguria, Cisalpine Gaul, and Spain. Well, Sicily isn't just the biggest island of the Mediterranean, it's also slap bang in the middle of the Mediterranean. So throughout the last 2,500 years or so, it has always been a flashpoint because its north coast faces towards the western Mediterranean, its south coast faces towards Africa, and the east coast, and this is quite important, faces towards Greece. Sicily was therefore destined to become the site where fighting first broke out between the two nations. These were the first blows in a war which would spread to engulf the known world and lead to the death of a city. As the Carthaginian base at Agrigentum grew in scale, Roman reaction was typically swift and determined. The Roman legions descended on the Carthaginians and dealt them a savage blow. But the island was not to be so easily conquered. Due to her mastery of the sea, Carthage was able to reinforce her troops on Sicily by sea. It was obvious that whoever controlled the sea lanes controlled the course of the war. There were two reasons why Rome had to therefore to create a large fleet. First of all, it had already been finding some under a certain amount of attacks coming against to Italy. So for a purely defensive concept, they needed a navy for local help. But really their main purpose, of course, was to create a large and powerful navy which could go across the whole of the sea and therefore take the war to Carthage. 
The Romans knew that to be successful against Carthage, they had to become masters of a new arena, the sea. To defeat Carthage, a powerful navy was a necessity. These ships were to become the best of the great Roman navy. The sleek craft went a long way to extending the Roman influence to all corners of the known world. Below decks, however, conditions were a living hell. Unlike the fleet of the Greeks, which were crewed by free men who drew wages, the Roman ships were powered by slaves. It is almost impossible to comprehend the sheer misery of what life must have been like for a galley slave. Chained in position in a dim, rancid, claustrophobic environment, these poor souls were ordered to row continuously at the whim of their cruel masters. However barbaric and inhuman this system was, as far as the Romans were concerned, the end justified the means, and the galleys were the means to achieve the greatest empire the world had ever seen. When we try to find the remains of the Carthage which the Romans sacked and raised to ground, we, it's the maritime element that we can find, because where the galleys lay, the ship sheds, they have been found and they've been excavated. So in fact, we can, by measuring the foundations, the slipways there, we can tell exactly how large the Carthaginian galleys were, which fought against Rome, and of course, which lost. As one might expect, the start made by the Romans in the drive for domination of the sea was inauspicious. The first few encounters made the Roman navy look as green and inexperienced as in reality it was. But ultimately, this new force would bring to an end the Carthaginian command of the seas that had endured for centuries. The years of Carthaginian naval invincibility were about to be shattered. The first steps on the road to the destruction of a city had begun. After the initial setbacks, the Roman navy began to win the first few small engagements. This was enough to fuel the desire to take the battle into the very heart of enemy territory, Africa itself. These early successes at sea hid a greater threat for the Romans on land. Their forces were commanded by the Roman consul, Attilius Regulus, a man whose arrogance was eventually to destroy Roman gains in Africa. He would allow victory to be plucked from his grasp. By his foolishness, he would prolong the life of the doomed city he had come to destroy. The Roman armies landed on the inhospitable shores of North Africa. From here, they could easily build a threat to Carthage. To show they meant business, they swiftly took possession of the town of Clupea. With 15,000 infantry and 500 cavalry, Regulus began the march towards Carthage plundering and laying waste the land as he progressed. Under Marcus Atilius Regulus, the Romans achieved remarkable success on African soil. Originally, he was only set out there to establish an advanced base and to wait for reinforcements. In fact, he discovered that the opposition was so weak that he kept moving until he was within a day's march of Carthage itself. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts Presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything, from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. Too late, Carthage understood that it was about to face a formidable army. The Carthaginian commander, Hamilcar, led his troops out to meet the Romans who had reached the town of Addis, 15 miles south of Tunis. They were to face an adversary who would one day come to dominate the world, a legacy which would derive from a mixture of brute force and cunning. The Romans were to show both that day. A surprise dawn attack by the Roman legions quickly dispersed the Carthaginians. The desert sands now ran red with blood for the first time. 
Despite a spirited counter-offensive, the initiative now lay with the invaders, and Hamilcar was forced to retreat to Carthage itself. Within a short space of time, Tunis fell into the hands of the Romans. Carthage and Carthaginian morale was now effectively at its lowest point. All Regulus had to do was to maintain an effective siege, starve the defenders into submission, and the war would be over. Rome would have her first great victory overseas. But at this period of deep despondency for Carthage, a Greek mercenary arrived in Africa. Almost single-handedly, he would reverse the military situation. His name was Xanthippus. He's an experienced general who looks at the organization of Carthaginian troops and announces that the only problem the Carthaginians have is with their generals who are too inexperienced. There's some huffing and puffing, the Carthaginians argue about it, and then they decide to put Xanthippus in charge of their own army. They're that desperate that they'll turn to a mercenary general. The Roman position in North Africa was in great shape, but despite the bright portents of an impending victory over the Carthaginians, the year 255 BC was to prove one of the blackest in Roman history. To save themselves from a long siege and eventual starvation, the Carthaginians needed to defeat the Romans in a set-piece battle on the dusty plains outside their city. The Romans had no need to accept battle and had merely to keep the Carthaginians bottled up in their city. But in his vanity, Regulus, the Roman commander, allowed the Carthaginians to come out and fight. He was confident his legions would destroy them utterly. With the help of Xanthippus, the Carthaginians would prove him wrong, tragically wrong. The reason? A new and terrifying weapon of war, the elephant. On the advice of Xanthippus, the Carthaginian levies were drawn up in the center and on the left wing, with heavily armed Greek mercenaries on the right wing. In front of each wing, a mixed force of horsemen and light-armed mercenaries were placed. And in front of the entire force was a line of war elephants. The Romans, unused to the sight of elephants in battle, were naturally nervous of these terrifying monsters. The nervous men deepened their lines, making them shorter. Taking advantage of the uncertainty in the Roman ranks, the Carthaginian light cavalry charged forward and routed their Roman counterparts. Unnerved by the sight of the elephants, the Roman cavalry may well have been glad to flee the field. The Carthaginians then wheeled in over the legions who were now being trampled by the elephants. Those who avoided the elephants came face to face with the unbroken lines of Carthaginian levies advancing towards them. On that hot day, they were butchered on the spot. Only 2,000 of the Romans managed to escape. A mere 500 were taken prisoner, including Regulus. The rest perished. The disaster on the plains of Carthage was not over for the Romans. 350 ships had been sent to transport the army home. They took on board the small number of survivors and with room to spare, set sail from the African coast. Ill fortune dogged the steps of even the relief force. The fleet could not rest on the coast of Sicily, which was still occupied by the Carthaginians. And as they sailed southwards, they were caught in a tremendous storm. The fleet was decimated. Only 80 of the ships survived to see Rome again. The humiliation which Rome had received at the hands of Xanthippus fueled their desire for revenge. Robbed of her sea power, Rome struck back, near to home, on the old killing fields of Sicily. Despite much bitter and protracted fighting, neither side was able to turn the situation in Sicily to their advantage. And for the next eight years, until 242 BC, 
the two adversaries pinned one another down on the northeast of the island in a constant but unproductive series of skirmishes, raids, and sea battles. After 22 years of war, the Romans were still no closer to ultimate victory, and the continuous drain on money and men was causing great concern in Rome. It was obvious that sea power was still the key to the conflict. So, in a last effort to break the stalemate, the Romans invested in a fleet of 200 ships and at the beginning of summer 241 BC, sailed for Sicily. So it was that the final engagement of the First Punic War took place at sea. It ended in a crushing defeat for the Carthaginians. They were forced into a humiliating peace agreement. During the course of the First Punic War, the balance had swung in favor of Rome. Inevitably, the scales were to tip back the other way. One man was to play a greater role than any other. In the Second Punic War, a man rose to prominence who, with his ingenuity, courage, and resourcefulness, made his place in the history books secure. His name was Hannibal. As the fate swung back in favor of Carthage, his actions would take him to the very gates of Rome. Was Hannibal solely responsible for causing the Punic War? Was he driven by his hatred of the Romans? Uh, by re desire for revenge from the First Punic War? Perhaps, but I think that neglects what his father and his brother-in-law were doing in Spain in the intervening period, conquering Spanish territories, and it also tends to diminish Rome's own responsibility for the Second Punic War. For example, it doesn't point out that the Carthaginians, of course, were reacting to the way the Romans grabbed Sardinia from them. Surviving records of the man are naturally few, but the Roman poet Juvenal immortalized Hannibal in one of his satires. Put Hannibal in the scales. How many pounds will that peerless general mark up today? This is the man for whom Africa was too small a continent, though it stretched from the surf-beaten ocean shores of Morocco, east to the steamy Nile, to tribal Ethiopia, and new elephant's habitats. Now Spain swells with his empire. Now he surmounts the Pyrenees. Nature sets in his path high alpine passes, blizzards of snow. But he splits the very rocks asunder, moves mountains with vinegar. Now Italy is his. Yet still he forces on. We have accomplished nothing, he cries, till we have stormed the gates of Rome, till our Carthaginian standard is set in the city's heart. Well, the Second Punic War can be seen partly, of course, as a war between Rome and Carthage, but also as a war between one particular group of Carthaginian commanders, related the family we call the Barkids, and Rome. And the war was fought on, on two levels. On one level, uh, the Romans decided that they had to eliminate uh, not just Hannibal, but Hannibal's relatives, and that's the reason why right from the start of the war, they went to the support of one of their allies in Spain, and the Spanish war was as fiercely fought as the war in Italy itself, and had very interesting long-term consequences. The fact that Spain is a country which speaks uh, Latin language today as a result uh, of the Second Punic War. Hannibal became commander-in-chief of the Carthaginian army in 221 BC, and success was his from the outset. He masterminded the storming of a city belonging to the Romans at Saguntum in Spain after an eight-month siege. Goaded beyond restraint by this new young upstart, Rome declared war again in 218 BC. In a swift and decisive move, Hannibal embarked on his epic march from Spain to Italy. The pages of history were about to be altered forever. Hannibal had his winter headquarters at Nova Carthago. A move on Rome meant crossing the Alps. Traditional military thinking would have said, wait for spring, then move. But Hannibal, great general that he was, 
understood the value of surprise. He would move in winter, come what may. Hannibal is another of the greatest commanders of this period of the old world. He'd been told by his family that his greatest enemy was to go and destroy Rome as the only thing he was to attempt for. And so he conquered great areas in Spain, and then, which was totally shook Rome, was when he brings his army across over the Alps. Hannibal had at his disposal some 90,000 infantry, 12,000 cavalry, and 37 elephants. Some of these troops had to be left to secure territory in Spain, so he marched over the Pyrenees and arrived in Gaul, now France, with 50,000 infantry and 9,000 horse, together with his full complement of elephants. Arriving at the River Rhone, Hannibal organized a successful crossing. Despite constant attacks, he then slipped away from a Roman contingent led by Scipio, who was astonished to find that Hannibal and his entire army had eluded him by moving in the opposite direction from the one he expected. Surely he could not be planning to cross the highest mountains in the world, the Alps. Surely the feat was impossible. Hannibal knew better. Who was then? the great general Hannibal. Well, Livy presents Hannibal as, rather curiously, having the outstanding characteristics of a good Roman general. He showed vigor, he shows courage, he's a superb tactician. He shows all the Stoic virtues. For example, he'll wear his cloak and sleep on the ground like his sentries. He can withstand extremes of hot or cold. Um, he's the first to attack, he's the last to retreat. All of these build up the image of a noble opponent, an outstanding enemy. But he adds to that a twist, is after listing the virtues, he lists the vices. And he says that Hannibal shows more than the usual Punic perfidy. He's given to inhuman cruelty, and he shows complete disregard for truth, honor, and piety. Simply to reach the mountains, Hannibal was constantly passing through the lands of other people. He came frequently under attack from hostile tribes along his route as he began to climb up into the mountain. Already his army was beginning to dwindle, as the historian Livy recalled. The Carthaginians thus found themselves facing two enemies, the hostile tribesmen and the terrible difficulty of their position in the narrow mountain defile. It was a case of every man for himself, and in their struggles to get clear of danger, they were often fighting with each other rather than with the enemy. It was the horses more than anything else which created havoc. Terrified by the din, they were soon out of control. In the confusion, many men and soldiers were flung over the sheer cliffs and fell to their deaths thousands of feet below. When they were planning to go over the Alps, Hannibal questioned how will they supply the troops. His friend and close relative, Margo, says, well, we'll just have to get them used to the idea of cannibalism. As people die, we can then eat the dead soldiers and move on. So you can see how a reputation may have arisen of cruelty. By late autumn, the weather in the mountains is already as bad as the worst winter at sea level. Hannibal's men spent three days constructing a road through the snow and ice of the Alps, but they battled on, and the 20,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry reached the Po Plains of northern Italy five months after leaving Nova Carthago. Having showed his skill as a strategist, Hannibal was now to prove his brilliance as a commander. In doing so, he would instill such great fear in the Romans that his name would be forever remembered. In the first of his major battles of the Italian campaign, he inevitably emerged as the victor. At the River Trebia, he skillfully used his knowledge of the topography to enable him to slaughter the Roman legions. But Hannibal himself would not emerge unscathed. He lost the sight in one eye, but it did not restrict his ability as a commander. The next year, 
218 BC, he repeated his successful actions further south at Lake Trasimir. Once more, Livy recalled the event. For three long and bloody hours, the fight continued, and most furiously about the person of the Roman commander Flaminius. A mounted trooper, putting spurs to his horse, cut down the armor bearer who had tried to check his murderous intent and drove his lance through Flaminius's body. The consul's death was the beginning of the end. Panic ensued. Men tried blindly to escape by any possible way, plunged into the edge of the lake till the water was up to their necks, and they were either drowned or, struggling back, exhausted into the shallow water, were butchered wholesale by mounted troops who rode in to meet them. The Romans lost 15,000 men. 2,000 were taken prisoner. The following year, the slow progress of the Carthaginian army through Italy continued. Hannibal moved on again, down to Apulia on the Adriatic coast, laying waste the land as he passed. The Roman defeat at Lake Trasimene had several serious consequences. In the first place, the consul Flaminius was killed in battle. Then the other consul, attempted to send reinforcements which arrived three days late and also were wiped out by Hannibal. The end result, of course, is that morale at Rome plummeted. They weren't used to losing, and yet they'd had the news of two major disasters. Hannibal seemed to be unstoppable. In 216 BC, he inflicted another heavy defeat on the Romans in his famous victory at Cannae, the largest Roman army ever amassed and commanded by one man was completely destroyed, their fighting skills absorbed by a huge crescent formation of magnificent Celtic and Spanish warriors. Livy tells of an encounter between two commanders in the chaos that followed the battle. Courage, said Paulus. You have little time to escape. Do not waste it in useless pity. Get you gone and tell the Senate to look to Rome and fortify it with strong defenses before the enemy can come. And take a message to Fabius that while I lived, I did not forget his counsel and that I remember it still in the hour of death. As for me, let me die here among my dead soldiers. The two men were still talking when a crowd of fugitives swept by, the Numidians were close on their heels. Paulus fell under a shower of spears, his killers not even knowing whom they'd killed. Almost the entire army shared the fate of Paulus. Well, we don't really know where the Battle of Cannae was fought in detail. It's, um, probably it was on the south bank of the river uh, Alfidius in southern Italy. But the fact is that the ancient historians who described the battle, Polybius and Livy in particular, weren't really interested in these details. What they were interested was, again, a good literary account of a marvellous battle with a wonderful, surprising victory for Hannibal with his much smaller forces over the much larger Roman forces. As dawn rose over the field of battle, the extent of human butchery was awesome. Livy describes the scene. All over the field, Roman soldiers lay dead in their thousands. Here and there, wounded men covered in blood who had been roused to consciousness by the morning cold were dispatched with quick blows as they struggled to rise from amongst the corpses. Others were found still alive with the sinews in their thighs and behind their knees sliced through, baring their throats and necks and begging who would to spill what little blood they had left. Some had their head buried in the ground and having apparently dug themselves holes and by smothering their faces with earth had choked themselves to death. Most strange of all, was a Numidian still alive and lying with nose and ears horribly lacerated underneath the body of a Roman who, when his useless hands had no longer been able to grasp his sword, had died in the act of tearing his enemy in bestial fury with his teeth. He had won an unbroken series of savage victories, but now Hannibal's touch began to desert him. 
Now he had his enemy at his mercy. Inexplicably, he did not capitalize on his successes at Cannae by marching on Rome. Instead, he allowed his men to spend time in the devastation of the rich Italian farmland. As they did so, the lazy progress of Hannibal's army through Italy continued. He made a rapid march on Rome, which of course was meant to shock the Romans, which indeed it did, it caused great panic. But there was never any question of him being able to march on Rome and taking it by force anyway. Town after town fell to Hannibal and his Celtic warriors, but the Roman armies facing him on the field could not pin him down to another major battle. Crucially, he did not make the lightning strike on Rome, which would surely have won victory for Carthage. Instead, he besieged Tarentum. This was to prove the largest city to fall to him. Its capture further reduced the waning Roman influence in the heel of Italy. But it was not Rome. By 211 BC, the moment arrived that all Rome had been dreading. Hannibal was finally marching on Rome, and this was to be a turning point in the war. It is said that he who hesitates is lost. Hannibal was now to suffer the consequences of that sage advice. His hesitation was to have grave consequences for him and his city. The wheel of fortune was about to turn against him. He had missed his chance. Rome was once again gathering her military strength. Instead of assaulting Rome, Hannibal turned aside from its great walls. It is a moment in history historians will debate forever. Once more, he fell to plunder and devastated the surrounding countryside. Hannibal, it seemed, had lost the masterful touch that was the hallmark of the initial years of the campaign. He was never to regain the momentum of the early successes. Little by little, the Romans began to gain the upper hand, recapturing territory they had lost to Hannibal. Inexorably, the tide was turning. The Romans now had the initiative, and Hannibal's responses were like those of a tired boxer in the last round of a world title bout. Hannibal was pushed back and back until he was hemmed into the port of Brutium. From there, he quietly slipped out and set sail for Africa. Hardly a fitting end for an expedition that had begun so triumphantly and made the world tremble. One of the amazing things about Rome as a military power is that Rome was able to draw onto such massive resources of manpower uh, and indeed financial resources as well that Rome was able to sustain these wars on several fronts and uh, in the end uh, solutions uh, were found, all of which uh, favoured the Romans' um, peace with Philip V, the destruction of Syracuse by Marcellus. Uh, Marcellus is a rather interesting man because uh, about 10 years before this, in a battle against the Gauls, he had personally himself killed the Gallic chieftain in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. So he knew what it was to actually destroy an opponent, and he used the excuse of uh, a massacre of um, Romans by the Syracusan regime in order to sack Syracuse, destroy Syracuse. Um, this is a well-known fact because one of the people uh, who lost their lives in uh, that sack was the mathematician Archimedes. Onto the stage now stepped the great new Roman general Scipio. He was determined to carry the war to the heartland of his enemy. Scipio set sail for Africa in 204 BC for what was to prove the decisive expedition in the Second Punic War. It was he who masterminded the encounter that was to bring ultimate victory to Rome, the great battle at Zama, fought in 202 BC. Hannibal and Scipio met before the fighting began to try and negotiate peace terms. No longer the triumphant general of old, 
It was Hannibal who spoke first. He spoke from experience, and he spoke from the heart. The greater a man's success, the less it must be trusted to endure. This is your hour of triumph, while for us, all is dark. To you, peace, if you grant it, will be a splendid thing and fair to look upon. Certain peace is better than the uncertain hope of victory. The one is in your hands, the other in the hands of God. Do not stake the success of so many years upon the decision of a single hour. The luck of a single hour can tumble to the ground the honors we have won. I was the aggressor in this war, and just as I did what I could till the gods envied my success, to ensure that none of my people should regret it, so shall I strive that none may regret the peace obtained through my endeavors. Even the sincere humility of Hannibal's speech failed to convince Scipio to accept the terms offered. And at dawn the next day, he led his men into a ferocious and, for Hannibal, calamitous battle. From Hannibal's point of view, the battle went wrong from the outset when his cavalry was routed. In the old days, they had been the bulwark of his success. But in war, it seems that when your luck runs out, it sometimes disappears altogether. So it was for Hannibal. Although both armies were fairly evenly matched, as the two vast masses of opposing infantry slowly rolled into one another, screaming their war cries and beating their shields, almost inevitably it was the Romans who remorselessly drove back the Carthaginian front line. These men finally broke and attacked their own second line in a frenzied attempt to escape. They, in turn, were caught between the Romans and the third line of Carthaginians with their leveled spears. The Romans regrouped and advanced across the ground that was now slippery with blood and choked with bodies. Veterans of the Cannae slaughter came face to face with Hannibal's veterans, and the fighting was bitter and pitiless. It ended only when Scipio's cavalry returned to charge from the rear and cut the Carthaginian lines to pieces. The two generals met amidst the carnage of the field. For Hannibal, it was a tragic end to an illustrious career. Reluctantly, he advised his political masters to sue for peace. The Second Punic War was over. Rather like Germany after World War I, the Roman peace terms applied to Carthage were harsh and humiliating, like the Treaty of Versailles. Rather than lay their seeds of peace, they actually sowed the seeds of the next war. Carthage was stripped of her military machine and had to pay large war reparations to the Romans. Times were hard in Carthage. Livy tells us of an incident that occurred when its citizens were trying to raise money to pay their first indemnity to the Romans. While others bemoaned their lot, Hannibal ostensibly was laughing. When rebuked for this lack of solemnity, he replied, if eyes could see the mind within as they do the expression of the face, it would soon be apparent to you that this laughter springs from a heart that is almost beside itself with its misfortunes. And yet laughter is far less untimely than your irrational and misplaced tears. The time to weep was when our arms were taken from us, our ships were burnt, and we were forbidden foreign wars. That was when we received our death blow, when the spoils of war were being stripped from vanquished Carthage, and you saw her left naked and unarmed. No one raised a moan. All too soon, I fear you will realize that it is the least of your troubles which call forth these tears today. The sad, lonely figure of the once great Hannibal was later to die by his own hand, a forlorn refugee in a foreign court at the age of 64, a sad demise for a man who had served his country so well. Certainly after the Battle of Zama at the end of the Second Punic War, Carthage was in no sense a power to rival Rome. So the question really is why did the Romans not leave Carthage in peace?
And one of the important factors is that the Roman alliance functioned and functioned successfully because Rome was prepared to intervene everywhere and without asking too many questions on behalf of any state or city or king that had become an ally of the Roman people. The Romans knew that if they did not back their allies in any matter at all, then that effectively would signal to allies throughout the Mediterranean that Rome was not to be relied on. So throughout the first half of the second century, the Romans were prepared to allow their client king, an ally of Rome, Massinissa, in Numidia, that's modern Algeria, to be extremely horrid to the Carthaginians. And that meant that there came a point where the Carthaginians just couldn't put up with this any longer. For a proud nation like Carthage, for whom war had been a way of life for so long, an unjust peace did not come easy. The humiliating terms of peace reached at the end of the Second Punic War cut to the very soul of her people. The re-emergence of the fighting spirit of Carthage was to signal the beginning of the Third Punic War. But it was the end for the once great city-state. The reality was that war was inevitable anyway. Rome now sought the death of Carthage, the only way she could see to end the rivalry forever. The Carthaginians finally gave Rome the excuse she needed when she went to war with one of her neighbors. Despite doing all in their power to try to comply with Rome's wishes, the Carthaginians could not meet the unreasonable demands of the Romans. A Carthaginian delegation to the Senate began to understand the danger from Rome the moment they heard the chilling address. Bear with fortitude the final commands of the Senate. Surrender Carthage to us and retire anywhere you like within your territory, provided that it is at least 10 miles from the sea. We have decided to raise your city to the ground. Faced with the prospect of complete annihilation, the proud Carthaginians would not yield without a struggle. They declared war on Rome and set about a hurried rearmoring. In an eerie parallel with the events in Germany before World War II, soon they were mass producing shields, swords, missiles for catapults, spears and javelins, and as many catapults as they could. The Romans still believed Carthage to be almost defenseless. They believed that a simple assault would be sufficient to take the city. Taking their leisure, the Roman army arrived and camped in front of the defenses, but it was not to be as simple as they imagined. Three attempts to take the city were repulsed. Using a huge battering ram, the Romans smashed their way through the outer defenses, but a determined counterattack by the Carthaginians threw them back. These attacks and counterattacks dictated the course of a protracted war which would drag on for the next three years. Finally, in 146 BC, Scipio was in a position to deliver the final blow to the city. And when it came, it brought with it the most brutal and bloody street fighting recorded in ancient history. One of the reasons why the Romans decided that Carthage had to be destroyed and taken over by Rome was not necessarily that the Romans were afraid of Carthage, though there was one Roman who constantly said that they should be afraid of Carthage, that was Cato the censor. It was rather, perhaps, that the Romans were afraid of their allies, the Numidians. What the Romans didn't want was for Carthage to be totally part of uh, the Numidian-controlled territory. So, in a sense, the Romans may have intervened in the Third Punic War not because they were afraid of Carthage, though they obviously used Carthaginian resistance uh, to Numidia as an excuse, but because in a war between Carthage and Numidia, they didn't want Carthage to fall to Numidia. The final and grimmest task for the Romans was to attack the citadel. There were three steep streets leading up to it, each lined with houses, every one of which had to be stormed to eradicate the vicious resistance from within. Bodies fell from roofs and windows to be impaled on spikes or swords below. Roman assault troops flooded in, wave upon wave of them, replacing exhausted or wounded comrades. 
Scipio ordered that all houses should be burned, and this brought new horrors. The old, sick, and infirm perished in the flames, while the living and the dead were piled into holes to make the roads passable. After seven gruesome days, the Carthaginian commander, Hasdrubal, surrendered. With the fiery spirit which had made the Carthaginians worthy adversaries, his wife, in disgust, cursed her husband as a coward and traitor. Rather than enter upon a life of slavery, she killed her two children and threw herself into the flames of her burning city. Carthage was destroyed by the Romans because Rome could not have a contestant in the trade war. Rome, the little city founded originally on seven hills on the Tiber, was flexing its muscles. The Phoenicians coming from the Levant, the area of Lebanon and Syria, have been the great traders of antiquity. One of their great, or their greatest trading city was Carthage, and the Carthaginians wanted to expand. They had moved into Sicily, and so you have these two great opposing nations. One already big, trading, rich, maritime. The other one, Rome, flexing her muscles, if you like moving down through Italy, looking towards Sicily, and the Carthaginians were there. And this is why we had this series of Punic Wars. They're essentially trade wars and a war of supremacy, as indeed we know, eventually Rome was master of the known world. For 10 days, the fires raged. When the inferno subsided, Carthage had been wiped from the political map of the world. When we go back to Carthage nowadays, what we see are the remains of Imperial Rome. Outside of modern Carthage, it's an area called Bursa. This is where we find the great amphitheater, the baths built by the Roman Emperor Antoninus Pius in the second century AD. So really, Carthage of the Carthaginians, you cannot see it except in the museum, in the material relics which have been found by excavation. Virtually nothing stands above ground. It was also to be excised from the geographical map too. Scipio is said to have spoken to the historian Polybius as they watched the destruction glowing in front of them. Is this not a splendid sight? asked Polybius. A splendid sight indeed, Polybius, replied the Roman. And yet, I am in fear, I know not why, that someday the same order will be given to destroy my own country. Although it was yet some centuries off, the day would come when Rome too would feel the wrath of the invaders. Like Hannibal before him and the people of Carthage, Scipio knew only too well just how fleeting the favors of the goddess of war can be.